today we will be visiting the book of 1 Peter, where we are taught that Jesus becomes the source of example and source of strength when we come into trials and tribulations in our life. I hope you all were able to get through the book of James and learning more about wisdom uh, we receive from God through the Bible and how our faith in God is so important in our life. Now for our weekly reading of Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God. Amen. Well, uh, this is the 21st book of the New Testament, written 64 AD, uh, author, apostle, Peter, um, who wrote 1st and 2nd Peter, but today we'll just be focusing on 1st uh, Peter. Uh, Peter was a fisherman uh, until shortly after his brother Andrew introduced him, um, him to Jesus um, in Bethsaida. Uh, Peter was allegedly uh, the first disciple to whom Jesus said his famous words, follow me. Jesus and Peter had a very close relationship. Jesus often rebuking Peter, though, for um, not understanding his messages. So they were so close they could really be honest with each other, it seems. Peter was also the disciple Jesus pointed to and said, Upon this rock I will build my church. He was one of the three disciples allowed to witness uh, the Transfiguration on the top of Mount Hermon where Jesus met uh, Moses and Elijah. Peter is the disciple who denied Jesus three times uh, after his arrest, which the Lord predicted uh, at the Last Supper. And yet Peter uh, went on to give, even after all of that, uh, Peter went on to give the first um, Christian sermon um, on the day of Pentecost. Well, what a series of events and and transformations, and uh, just really a, a, a wonderful witness. So, uh, he wrote First Peter to encourage Christians um, who were suffering under um, great, great persecution. Um, then, when Peter was uh, martyred uh, by crucifixion, uh, he did not feel worthy to be. Uh, die to die in the same way that Jesus did uh, so his persecutors crucified him upside down so it wouldn't be like Jesus now the places um, where Peter wrote were much different um, um, as Peter did not travel a lot uh, as much as the Apostle Paul did however he did visit Rome uh, his um, first stop in the north uh, did a, a lot he did a lot of work in the area of uh, Jerusalem in a place called Joppa J-O-P-P-A just west of Jerusalem um, so he stayed uh, there um, near home near the home of um, Simon the Tanner now this is significant that we'll talk about here in a minute but now in Acts 9 43 and 10 Acts 10 6 uh, 32 is the only time um, the occupation of the of a tanner um, is mentioned in the Bible uh, meaning tanning uh, the skins of animals now the significance of this is that a tanner was dealing with dead animals I remember this is the Jewish community right with cleanliness and holiness um, so this occupation um, was regarded um, with a great aversion um, by the Jews uh, because it necessitated ceremonial um, contamination um, especially in the case of the use of the unclean animals. Now here's the important point of why I covered that. Uh, the fact that Peter was willing to live with a tanner, okay, they were looked down upon uh, by the Jews, uh, reveals that Peter was already altering his views with reference to the Old Testament's ceremonial laws. So Peter was the ideal person to convey the Gospels um, to the Gentiles. 
And just a note, in case you're traveling um, in the area of Jerusalem, west of there, um, around Joppa, uh, St. Peter's Church is still located there. Now, Peter wrote the letter uh, during uh, the Roman Emperor uh, Nero's time. He's the real evil guy, right? Um, who really hated Christians and did horrible things, as we've mentioned several times um, in our Bible studies, um, throwing them to the lines and just other horrible things. So Peter was giving the people of the time encouragement to stay in course with Jesus no matter what happened, and they really needed that encouragement. The book of 1 Peter is considered a great source to read um, of when you're being picked on or when you're being bullied or when you're being persecuted for your faith. Uh, it's really helpful um, in those areas. Important points to remember in 1 Peter is that Jesus becomes the source of example when he comes into, uh, so for when we become into trials and tribulations, which happen all the time in life. So, by accepting God's help uh, in your perseverance and, and works of Christ, we can always have hope uh, in the midst of our suffering. So, um, a wonderful book um, for when we're challenged with great trials and tribulations. Now, um, a famous verse uh, in 1 Peter 5, um, for shepherds and sheep, it's talking about for those who lead the church and those who are in the church, um, using the um, terms shepherds um, and sheep. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 3. What leaders in the church must do, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Shepherd the flock of God. This line here, um, this was the first um, aspect of leadership um, that was being discussed here or taught here. Uh, Peter seemed to remember um, Jesus, Jesus' three-part commission um, that you can read more, uh, that he made to him, that you can read more in John 21, 15 through 17, if you want to make a note. In that passage, Jesus told Peter uh, to show his love for Jesus by feeding and tending Jesus' sheep. So here, this is all about uh, leading the church and the people in the church. A spiritual shepherd um, does his job in two ways. The first job is to feed the sheep. Um, Jesus emphasized this to Peter, and um, if you want to uh, study this a bit, that's in John 21, 15 through 17. And the second aspect of this job is to tend the sheep, which means protecting and guiding and nurturing and caring uh, for the sheep. Now, the most important tool to shepherd uh, the flock of God is to have a heart like the heart of Jesus, uh, one that is willing to give one's life to the sheep and who genuinely cares about uh, and is interested in them. Um, if you were a shepherd back then, you truly did protect the sheep with your life. So, uh, seeing as overseer, overseers, that term uh, for Peter, uh, the job of was the job of being a shepherd, um, is understood as the overseer. Um, this word for leadership, overseer, comes to the church from the Greek culture, and it is meant that someone who watches over. Uh, like a manager or a supervisor. Now the next, next line, not by compulsion, but willingly. Shepherds um, should not do their job by compulsion, as if they were being forced uh, into, into a task that they uh, really hated or really didn't want to do. Um, instead, they should serve God and his people willingly, uh, from a heart that loves God's people, uh, as a shepherd loves their sheep. Um, and wants to serve them. So, um, again, here a connection that as we all, um, uh, as those who lead the church, lead the church, we need to do it in love and uh, do it freely because we care and love all those in God's kingdom. Now, a uh, theologian or uh, a Baptist preacher and evangelist, excuse me, um, Frederick Meyer, 
um, said, none of God's soldiers are mercenaries or oppressed um, uh, men. They are all volunteers. We must have a shepherd's heart if we would do a shepherd's work. Now the next line, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Spiritual shepherds um, should not do their job for dishonest gain. Uh, this gain is dishonest because it was their motives um, uh, for serving as shepherds that uh, may have gone um, awry. Uh, but instead, they should serve eagerly, willingly serve without compensation. Uh, so they're doing it for the love of God, for the love of um, um, the sheep, or in our case, the love of people. The next line, nor is being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Shepherds um, um, should not do their job as lords, like lording over of someone, because the sheep do not belong to them. Um, they're just entrusted to them. Um, so the shepherds are to serve by being examples, not dictators. Another great lesson for us. Those entrusted to you, that line. Uh, that noun means a lot. Um, and then um, that which is assigned by lot uh, means a portion or a share of something. Uh, so theologian Paul um, Hybert shared, God has assigned the various portions of his precious possessions uh, to their personal care. So again, just as the sheep um, were assigned, so are um, those people of our church who are in our care. The idea here is that God has entrusted the responsibility of the spiritual care of, of certain individuals to particular shepherds, um, the leaders, the overseers. Now in 1 Peter 5, 4, the reward for leaders in the church. And the scripture reads, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So the line that says that when the chief shepherd appears, Peter reminded uh, shepherds in the church that they would answer one day uh, to the chief shepherd who will want to know uh, what they did with his flock. It is important for shepherds to realize that they, um, they lead Jesus' as sheep uh, because Jesus is the main shepherd. Jesus is the overseer. Uh, that we need to follow his guidance. The next line, you will receive a crown of glory. Um, faithful shepherds are promised a crown of glory in heaven um, that will not fade away, that term we used just a bit earlier. Um, crowns are um, not only for shepherds, but also for everyone in God's kingdom um, who was faithful to Jesus um, and did what um, Jesus, Jesus is God's will and did what we were told to do by being humble and by being watchful. You can read more about this if um, I caught your ear there with any of this um, in 1 Corinthians 9.25 and in 2 Timothy 4.8 and in James 1.12. Now, uh, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. This is about a promise for the humble. Um, every um, Everyone should be humble and watchful. It's what this verse is about, or what this um, is about. It reads, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. The line uh, it says, likewise, um, you younger people. Peter began um, this word of humility to the younger people um, in contrast to the elders. Um, so, um, but at some point quickly he realizes that um, it is applicable to all, not just the younger. So this word to be submissive to one another and to be clothed with humility applies to everyone. But perhaps um, it is suggested uh, he felt especially to the young. The term clothed, clothed with humility. 
Humility is demonstrated um, by submission. Uh, it is the ability to cheerfully uh, put away our own agenda for God's. Even if God's agenda is expressed um, through another person, that's why we have to, we, you know, we believe in the Holy Spirit runs through us, and we have someone come to us um, that we feel is um, uh, of God and their spirit. Um, we need to listen. Be clothed with humility is the next line. This phrase, be clothed, translates a rare, wor rare word that, it, that referred to a slave. Putting on an apron uh, before serving, just as Jesus did before washing the disciples' feet. You can study more in John 13, 4, or study around it, but that's a specific scripture. So, some examples um, of this humility um, for us to um, ponder on a bit would be the willingness to perform the lowest and littlest services for Jesus' sake. Uh, so, just no fanfare, no uh, recognition, just be willing to perform anything um, in God's kingdom. So, um, and here's one um, that's interesting. Uh, being con is being conscientious or being conscious have excuse me having consciousness of our own ability to do anything apart from God so being have this consciousness of our own ability um, that uh, we're not able to do anything apart from God the opposite of that would be in thinking we can do it all on our own so the willingness um, also here's another one the willingness to be ignored by men. How often do we just want to be told we did a good job or thank you or all of those things? And uh, this says um, another mark of humility uh, as an example would be the willingness to be ignored. And another, the next one, truly being centered on others and not self. We hear that all the time, uh, but that's very hard to do because our human nature seems to want to go to self first. And, we have to uh, turn that upside down. The next line, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter quoted Proverbs 3.34 to show that humility is essential to our relationships with God. So you can see that in Proverbs 3.34. So it's essential to our relationship with God um, to be um, humble um, if we want to live in God's grace. Um, his um, unmerited favor. In other words, we we don't earn it. Um, it's a gift. So, so we must lay aside our pride and be humble, not only to God, uh, but also to one another. So many things that um, God gives us that we need to pass along. This is another one of them. Now, when he talks about resist, um, theologian uh, Meyer um, shares that Grace and pride are eternal enemies. Grace and pride are eternal enemies. Pride demands that God blesses me. Uh, this is what I want. Uh, God blesses me in light of what I think I deserve. Grace deals with me on the basis of what is in God, not on the basis of anything in me. Uh, pride is one of the most um, despicable of sins. Um, and we often speak of it, um, we all often make light of it uh, uh, because we call it many times, oh, we're, we're just independent or I'm self-reliant. Uh, but that independence and self-reliance is the exact opposite. Uh, we need to be dependent and reliant on God. So um, if you're willing to be nothing, God's going to make something of it. Uh, I, I love that um, phrase. So if we're willing to be nothing, God's going to make something of it. Um, we need to be always happy and uh, ready to do whatever is needed in support of God's kingdom, no matter how small uh, it may be, because we never know what God's going to do with it, where God's going to take us with what we may have thought was the most smallest, most humble um, thing uh, we were doing. The next line, that he may exalt you um, in due time. So, if God um, has us in a humble place, uh, then we must submit to God's plan. So God knows um, the, the due time to exalt us, uh, uh, but we often think we know 
that there's a better time, that God needs to respond. That, um, and so, again, we're taking it upon ourselves to know. Or, so we need to continually uh, be trusting of God and patient to wait. Casting all your care upon him, this line. True humility is shown by our ability to cast our care upon God. If we would follow the, um, the command of uh, uh, 1 Peter 5, 6 that we uh, mentioned a little earlier and truly humble ourselves uh, under the almighty hand of God, we would have far fewer cares uh, to cast upon him um, as shown in 1 Peter 5, 7. If you go back and take a look. Theologian Spurgeon shares worries about ambition, popularity, wealth, things of self, all evaporate under the command to humble yourself. There are many um, anxieties um, that we are called to just do away with, get rid of uh, in the kingdom of God, such as anger, pride, ambition, uh, willfulness, willfulness, that's following our own will, um, Spurgeon says we must cast these to the winds. Do away with them. Get rid of them. So, he goes on to share with us that we must learn to pray. Okay, how do we, we say cast it to the wind? Well, we got to do something after we do that. So, uh, we need to pray. And that uh, prayer tells God uh, what our cares are. And ask God to help. Um, so, while faith believes that God um, can do it and will do it. So that's where our faith, we need to just maintain our faith and our belief that God's going to do something. And prayer spreads this trouble we have, these griefs we had, uh, before God, puts them before God uh, and releases us. Uh, and then faith, we cry out that uh, uh, I believe that God cares for me. And we get to that point there. We don't, we've, we've thrown our cares in front of him. We, we don't know the answer, don't know how long, um, uh, it's going to be before he answers them, if they're answered, in a way we may think. Um, but um, then we have to just believe that God cares for us. So, um, I believe God will bring um, uh, us out of distress. And, um, and, and we're, we're, as we're coming out of that distress with unknown results of not knowing how that's going to be answered, know that God's going to... Um, uh, uh, glorify his kingdom um, as we um, come out of whatever distress you know that we've talked before about uh, God will use bad things that have happened um, and uh, do something with it uh, uh, to move forward to uh, make things better the line for he cares for you uh, this is simple in that it is a belief that that God cares um, and this is very unique to our Christian faith. That is very, very unique um, compared to um, all other religions. So know that God loves you. Know that God cares for you. Know that God um, is a God of, of prayer and will answer our prayers in his own time. And we just need to be patient um, and faithful um, in our God. Amen. Well, this concludes our time together in First Peter. As always, I hope you learned and were enlightened um, in our readings this week uh, that may have helped us all move a little closer to God. Uh, next week, we're going to be studying the book of Second Peter, uh, where Peter uh, wanted to encourage uh, um, the people not to listen to the false teachers uh, and encourage them to continue on in faith, uh, no matter what persecution um, they came unto. Uh, so... Until next time, remember God loves you and go out and love somebody else. Amen.